Hey, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. In this episode of TWIP Talks, it's all about drones, State of the Union. Hey folks, I'm here sitting with my good friend, Mr. Eric Chang, formerly of DJI. Obviously, we're gonna be talking about some DJI gear as well as just kind of a general sense of what the UAV or drone industry is, where it is today, where it was, and maybe where it's going. So, Eric, welcome to your house. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to my house. Thank you. Beautiful house, by the way. Thank you. Um, and lots of stuff happening with you. A ton of stuff. Let's, <laughs> I mentioned in the beginning, formerly of DJI. So you've left. So yes. now what? What's, uh, what's, what's next on the horizon for you? Uh, Actually, I don't know. It's been really great. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah, I would. I mean, we we had a a baby, my son Mako, mm -hmm. seven and a half months ago, and I never got to take a proper paternity leave. So I'd like to take some time just to kind of reset. Um, I was out in Aspen last week shooting fall colors. Yeah. Uh, as a California boy, it was the first time I had really been out, uh, you know, in the wilderness yeah. during this time of year. So we were, we were, of course, flying out there. Of course. Um, and, and that was just a great way to spend a week kind of resetting, doing something creative again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah. I don't know, the future is, is always exciting. That's cool. Change, change is always, well, not always good, but <laughs> change, change is always growth with change, regardless, right? So, you know, this stuff, speaking of change, over the past, I mean, I've known you for several years now, but over the past, what, two years? Just exponential, rapid, relentless change in the drone space. We've seen, well, from my perspective, I don't know if it's accurate, but from my perspective, there was, you guys showed up, and then there's all these slew of competitors that showed up, and they're all doing different things, and there's micro drones and YouTube videos with swarms of drones. <laughs> You know, there's, it's in TV now, you know, it's right. a major part of American lexicon now and just in or just global lexicon in just in two years. So from your standpoint, you were from from my perspective, you are the guy that's sitting at the nexus of all this stuff. What do you see from your perch? Is it has it been that rapid change or is it just, you know, people are just now seeing these things and it seems new? What do you what do you think? Oh, there, there has definitely been rapid change. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's in part. Uh, because the technology is, is all here. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, you, people are able to build these in their garages right now. You mm -hmm. know, so if, if you decide you can go out and buy all the parts and build one for a few hundred dollars, it can, it can carry a camera. Yeah. Um, but w what's happened is, you know, some companies like DJI um, have decided to, to build integrated solutions. And, you know, in the same way that we, you know, you can build a pinhole camera if you want, but yeah. you, you choose not to. You, you buy a camera. It has buttons and all sorts of... Uh, ergonomics to allow you to be successful sure. when you're actually shooting. Um, and that's kind of been, you know, that was really what drew me to DJI in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. it was this, I, I knew that they were going to be the company um, working on integration. And in fact, when you fly one of these today, all of the controls are on the radio itself. So yeah. you want to take a picture, you push a button. You want to change the exposure, full manual exposure, you push a button. Yeah. It supports RAW, of course. You know, these are all the yeah. things, sorts of things that we're interested as, in as photographers. Yeah. So that integration, I think, is going to continue. You know, we'll see more and more companies. We are already seeing companies integrating in the same way, um, making flying cameras uh, with interchangeable lenses, for example, like this one. Yep. Um, and so I think they're, they're just, you know, from a photography perspective, they're, they're going to become tools. They will just yep. be cameras that you can position and maneuver in space. And maneuvering is really important because you can position easily, but it's very hard to have uh, beautiful movements through mm -hmm. space, you know? Yeah. Like fluid, non-jerky movements. Yeah. And I think what, what you're saying is it kind of speaks to the transition from hobbyist or hobby and propeller head, no pun intended, to Main Street, right? right. So like you were saying, like my brother back when it, back in the day, he used to build model airplanes and you know, and then go crash them. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's, it's part of the hobby. Yeah, it's part of the hobby. Uh, and you know, I could never understand like why would you spend months and months building this thing only to go crash it. I think now that these are here, I'm more of a customer of these type of things where I can just go spend some money and go fly and get great shots and not obsess over the fun of building it, right? Right. So that's back in the day, the hobby side of it was building the ship in the bottle mm -hmm. and then flying it for a few minutes. Fast forward to today, it's flying, right? I want to fly, right. I want to be an aerial photographer. So, so then with that said, so let's talk about technology a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So back in the day again, when, when DJI first came on the scene with the, with the Phantom, right? That was one of the first products that mm -hmm. came out. Great, 
flew great, you know, and you strap, strap a GoPro to the bottom of it and get some great shots. Now we're here, right? right. Two years later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like literally two years later, you went from the Model T of drones to, you know, something that came out of Star Wars. So, yeah. so how, tell me about that path from inside of the company. Was it just like relentless and just whiteboards everywhere, or you know, how did how did it feel doing that with that rapid change? Yeah, the, the perspective from inside the company obviously is different than yeah. what we see from the outside, sure. and what we see from the outside is a lot of excitement around what's possible with the products. Um, a lot of people complaining. People love to complain, yeah. you know. Yeah. They're complaining, you know, it's like one, one of these comedy skits where you're given something completely new and then suddenly you're, you're complaining about it, you know, yeah. when like two years prior you couldn't, you couldn't do it at all. Right, right. And suddenly, you know, you're complaining for some bizarre, tiny little nitpicky reason when you should be out flying and shooting. Yeah. Um, that's why I say shut up yeah. and shoot. <laughs> yeah, shut up and shoot. That's, <laughs> that's a good motto. Um, but, I, you know, I think being inside the company is is eye-opening because I think one of the reasons it's hard for anyone who inside DJI to respond to people who are commenting from the outside mm -hmm. is that it is impossible Just to... Just making sure it's still recording. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I see the red dot. Yep. Um, it's impossible to really understand what the company is until you've seen inside. And of course, we don't, no one lets you see inside. So this is kind of an interesting problem. Yeah. Um, but I, DJI is basically, it's, it's a technology and robotics research organization oh, that has a very fast path to productization mm -hmm. you know so one thing you know we there are literally there are hundreds of smart engineers in their 20s and 30s working on all sorts of technology and robotics yeah, so probably products right and within solutions. several square miles of where we're sitting right now yeah, yeah but also within DJI headquarters oh, okay. there are literally hundreds I mean many hundreds of engineers working on this stuff oh wow okay. and and so um, I've been really impressed because you know during the visits um, back to headquarters in Shenzhen uh, you go in and you see some idea that somebody has, and you know suddenly five or six months later, it's it's productized. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that period of time is not it traditionally hasn't been enough to go from conception of an idea to a shipping product. Mm -hmm. So I mean, whatever people think of DJI, that that ability I think is is one of the, the main advantages the company in that, has. And that like advantages and barriers to entry for com competition. Barriers. Right? And, I mean, look at this. You know, this is a Micro Four Thirds camera, so. A year and a half ago, the company joined the Micro Four Thirds Consortium. Yeah, I want to talk there, about that. There was some news about that, and and now there's a Micro Four Thirds camera. So, you know, I think one of the things that that impressed me and drew me to the company is that they're very focused on adapting new technologies or, or existing technologies like a camera, but pulling it into the company and developing them internally so that you're not hobbled by the things that you have to do integrating products that weren't made for yeah. for it, like integrating ground land-based cameras mm -hmm. into aerial workflows is difficult, yeah. you know? Yeah, you they're to, not designed for that. They're not, I mean, they're, they're heavy, they're, they're made of metal, so mm -hmm. you can, you know, drop them and have them survive. They have physical controls for hands, which you don't need in the air. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and these can be communicated with, uh, you know, from the flight controller. Right, right. Um, and then that gets all, passed all the way down to the controller and the apps. Yeah. So then, okay. <laughs> I, went, I had like a million questions okay, swirling well, in my head. You were asking about the evolution, so yeah, you can yeah, kind yeah. of summarize it by, yep. you, you look at the Phantom and it was the first thing you could take out of the box and fly. Yep. Okay, so you sort of handle the vehicle and the, the platform. Like literally within minutes. And, you're yeah, you, you can get in the air, they're, they're GPS stabilized. Um, these are much more stable than the earlier Phantoms. These are have two GPSs and all mm -hmm. sorts of other kinds of... Um, uh, vision systems that allow you to stabilize without GPS. It does look badass. <laughs> it does look badass. Yeah, um, but if you look at the technologies that were developed, there's, there's gimbal technology. You know, so this thing stabilizes at sub-pixel stabilization. So when the aircraft is moving, it's stabilizing um, by spec less than one pixel. So you shouldn't see that much movement. Um, you know, people have seen movement, but usually the conditions are horrible. But right? if you're hovering, say on a day like this, we've got a light breeze. It's not windy, windy. It's California, right? Right. So light breeze. You send this guy up, and you want to hand. You want to. You want to do a shot, and right. so you want to do a, a long, a long exposure. You know, say it's dusk or something. Could you do yeah. that with this? Is is the stabilization? In other words, is the stabilization good enough to do a long exposure that otherwise would have required a tripod? Can you do it from the air with this guy acting as your tripod? Yeah. So we see exposures from one to three or four seconds mm -hmm. very commonly without uh, blur. Wow. Um, I have seen and taken shots as long as eight seconds, which is the maximum exposure time for the older cameras. Yeah. Uh, without blur. So with this guy. 
Yeah, it's, okay. it's very strange to be able to take a long exposure shot from a moving platform. Um, in yeah, fact, like half a mile up. <laughs> yeah, wherever you want to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in fact, one of the best selling accessories um, uh, from a third party perspective, also DJI makes them now, are, are fil ND filters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are companies that sold ND, you know, 2, 4, 8, 16, and then actually people want 32s. Yeah. They want 64s because they want four second exposures of the ocean at dusk, for example. Sure, sure. Um, and you get, you know, beautiful abstracts with the water moving. Yeah. Um, so, Gimbal Tech key. And the, the yeah. other two pieces were, of course, camera. So DJI is now fundamentally a camera company as well That's as a drone you're... company, which is interesting. You know I have questions on I know, that, right? you do, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the last piece is wireless. So yeah. wireless transport protocols for high definition video, also in telemetry and drone control. So Lightbridge was the tech that was developed for that. Uh, and that's now incorporated into all of these products. So Lightbridge is just a, a slight detour. So Lightbridge gives you wireless control of the video, like full video back and control of the aircraft from how far away? Uh, it depends on the the product, mm -hmm. um, but like there, say this one. This yeah. is a, this is the high end, top of the line. I mean, we it, it's I just keep saying we because mm -hmm. I only left publicly yep. today, but yeah. they, um, yeah, yeah. they <laughs> DJ. Okay, so they're rated to two kilometers. You know, just over a mile, one point two, one point three miles. Yeah. Um, I frequently fly them a mile out. Um, you, you can see them, but there's like a, it's like that's going to say that's beyond like you yeah. lose vision at that point, you know, or I mean right. it's white, so you may be able to see a speck, but you it's can't see gone. orientation. Yeah, uh, you can definitely see it until you look away, and then mm -hmm. you have to look for it very mm -hmm. carefully. So uh, the telemetry is very important. There's there's a, a map overlay. It shows you where you are, where it is, and it always draws a green line back to the way you are, and it yeah. knows the orientation. So the the telemetry is is very very useful. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, so the, the kit, so say I'm, I'm decked out, I go buy one of these, I get this, I've got the controller, I've got my iPad mini on there, and I also need Lightbridge, a, a Lightbridge product to go with it? No, it's all integrated now. So there okay. are antennas in each one of the legs, the Phantom 3 is the same way. Um, Lightbridge used to be a standalone product. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Lightbridge 2 was just announced, which is a radio, like a RC controller mm -hmm. with a receiver. So it's eliminated the extra box on the on the transmitter side. Okay. So it's all integrated now. Um, so Lightbridge is, is just built in. Yeah. That's great, great. I need one. Okay. Let's switch to the, let's switch to cameras, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Micro Four Thirds. This has a Micro Four Thirds camera, and ironically, yeah, the lens out. that's on this thing right now is the same lens <laughs> yeah. that I'm using to shoot this <laughs> this interview. It with. was really convenient because you said, "Okay, let's talk Micro Four Thirds." So I could take this lens off and put it on that, and I looked at it and said, <laughs> "Yes, you can." <laughs> It's, it's the exact same, it's the same lens. lens. It's a 50, for those that are wondering, it's a 15 millimeter f1.7 Panasonic uh, Lumix lens. All right, let's pull this thing off. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is the Panasonic. It's a it's actually DJI branded. Mm -hmm. It's the same as the Panasonic lens, um, and you can pull it off, and you can just see. And that's my mount right there. That's your mount. But with that mount, so the other question I'd have is, okay, I've got several Micro Four Thirds lenses. Obviously, I don't want to send them all up in the air. But which ones can I send in the air? Which ones can't? So at, at launch time, uh, we, we announced support for four lenses. That mm -hmm. would be the, the DJI 15, the Panasonic 15, and the Olympus 12 and 17. So the 12 f.2 and the 17, okay. 17 2.8, I think. Yep. Um, and it, it's limited by, by two factors. Um, one is weight and balance. Yep. So gimbals need to be pretty uh, weighted pretty well, uh, balanced pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, DJI accomplishes the balancing through lens hoods. You know, so if you take this lens hood off, it'll pro it's back heavy, and when yeah. you put it on, it's it's pretty close. Um, the Olympus 12 2.0 works very well without a lens hood. That's how I use it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the other ones will require accessory lens hoods. It's, there's also the the width, so you know you can see this lens is fairly close um, in terms of fit here. Yeah. Um, so lenses that are too wide, of course, won't fit in the mount sure. either. Sure. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, because one of the one of the questions was, okay, is DJI sure they it sounds like they they are using the Micro Four Thirds standard, but they're gonna force you to buy lenses, thereby opening up another revenue stream. And you're saying it's not really the case, right? It's no. more of a factor of mechanics mechanical engineering and the size of the lens that you know. Okay. I you probably can't be in the consortium consortium without having support for lenses. But of course in, in this case if you do put a long lens on that's weighted and properly, you can burn the gimbal out. And I don't right, think DJI like, will be too happy if you know if they publish support for these lenses and you you go out of your sure. way to put something else on. Sure. Yeah, that's great. So let's. I want to. 
So you mentioned, you said something fundamental. You said DJ is a camera company now, right? So you're right. not just a drone company, now a camera company. And one of the recent releases that just came out last week was the DJI, it was the Osmo, right? Mm -hmm. Osmo? Osmo. Osmo, which is a handheld, it's like this thing, it's like the gimbal, mm -hmm. but it's handheld so you can run around getting Steadicam-esque shots, you know, but everyone can do it now. So, which is a great product, by the way, I think I may get one, <laughs> but what about, uh, so competition. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of press recently about um, GoPro and how GoPro is going head to head with DJI and they're like, hey, we're gonna take your market share in the, in the aerial drone UAV space because you're playing in the action camera space right. and all that. I mean, is there validity to that? From the outside looking in, it's like, okay, a logical next step would be for these guys to build their own cameras and therefore they can make a better product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't even use GoPro, so I don't want to put a GoPro. I don't want to have to go buy a GoPro to put it on my the thing that I purchase. And on the other hand, as a consumer looking in, looking at GoPro, I'm thinking, okay, you guys have nailed the action camera space, which is awesome. But are you a camera company? You know, a, a, right. an aerial UAV company, kind of like Apple going into cars, right? You guys make awesome phones, but uh, I'm not so sure about the cars. You know, right. so what what do you say to that? Yeah, well, actually, this is the first interview I've done where, you know, in which I haven't been directly affiliated with DJI. Yeah, so in the good. past, I had to be very <laughs> sensitive. I still have to be sensitive because I, I actually use both products. Sure. You know, I have always used GoPros and really like the company. And, mm -hmm. of course, I, I continue to use DJI products yep. and really like it as well. Um, I, I mean, I think the two companies have different strengths. You know, yeah. DJI, obviously, product, drones, even, even cameras. Their first cameras have been quite good you know mm -hmm. and um, I mean they've actually eliminated a, a large chunk of, of my GoPro workflow which is involves perspective correction yeah. you know which which yeah. I hate doing and you know I want you know I have GoPros with replacement lenses that are rectilinear um, but but I use them for different purposes you know GoPros I, I mount all over the place and when I need something that's very compact I, I tend to use them mm -hmm. and of course GoPros marketing prowess is is unparalleled yeah you know, they're, they're, con they're yeah. connection to sports and um, whatever industry they're interested in, they get connected with major players who use their products. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens because I, they're not a drone company. Mm -hmm. You know, the drone folks who are working internally um, have experience building them, but um, but the company itself isn't it's hasn't in the so far traditionally been known as an engineering company. Yeah. But so, you know what they do in Silicon Valley, though. You know, companies when they don't have core competency in a particular area, they go buy right. it or acquire it right. and then retool it and then push out a new product. Theoretically, right. GoPro has relatively deep pockets right now. They could do that, right? And we would know about it because they're public. Right. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Since we don't know about it, they haven't done it. So, right. you right. know, I think it takes some That's time. True. I didn't it, think about it, it takes time to integrate. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, I, I don't think anybody disputes that DJI has a multi-year head start. Yeah. You know, and, you know, a lot of the competitors, 3D art, I mean, Chris, says that mm -hmm. all the time and Chris Anderson, yeah. yeah Chris and and you know they're approaching the drone space from a different direction and I think GoPro is going to have to direct to approach from a different direction which is you know what what does the GoPro audience really need you yeah. know do they need the same things that that we need as professional photographers or do they need something that they can not think about and follow them you know when they're uh, when they're doing whatever they want to be captured right that's durable you know, yeah. like I, I would love something that f fits in a backpack that's not fragile, you know, that is very hard to destroy, you know, that you could crash into a tree and survive or something. Right. And honestly, if anyone's doing follow me and we can talk about follow me because yeah, I know I that you know. wanted to. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 a fragile product. It's just not going to survive in the marketplace. Yeah. You know, so so, you know, in preparation for this interview, I'm looking at, I looked at the obviously lots of DJI promotional materials, including the Osmo video that mm -hmm. was out there. And looking at that video and some of the videos that, that GoPro has on their website, it's it's interesting because on the DJI side of things, you see consumers that mm -hmm. are out there running around holding the Osmo, getting awesome Steadicam-esque shots. On the GoPro side, it's action, right? You've got right. people doing flips and snowboards and hang gliding and rock climbing and all that stuff with cameras on them and you know strapped to cars and all that stuff. It's high end, or not high end, it's high impact action stuff. Yeah. Is that, I mean, am I reading that right? It's like, okay, GoPro is for that and Osmo is for the consumer. Is that a, is that a good position? 
Maybe. I think, I mean, I mean they're both is, consumers, yeah, they're obviously, both, but, yeah. you know, non-action sports. So on the Osmo video, there were just yeah. normal people walking around taking photos of babies and stuff like that, right. you know. I mean, I think both products are actually aimed at a very similar audience. Mm -hmm. And in fact, pricing is, is pretty similar. It's very Osmo's, similar. Osmo is, is not that expensive for what you get. Right. Um, and, uh, but I think one approach is kind of aspirational. You know, you look at it and you think, I want to be like that athlete and I, I, I'm going to look like that. When if I, I just buy that camera, yeah, I'll, I'll buy be that doing camera, flips. Even though you don't look like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, Osmo, is, it's, I think they're just, they're just different approaches. And, yeah. and one of the things about the drone space that's, that's most exciting is that um, so many people can think of uses for them. You know, action cams, to some extent, is, is similar, but for drones, it extends far into industry. Yeah. You know, industri industrial use is really interesting and obvious for player people. Like, you know, we had a conversation about photogrammetry. It's yeah. just like 2D and 3D modeling from the air. Yeah. And, and you, you were just like, well, what would you use that for? And mm -hmm. there are like 100 examples you could give in 10 minutes. And as soon as you think of one, then you think of 100 more. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's what's so exciting about this space is like people can go out and like, I think what drew me to aerial imaging and low altitude aerial imaging specifically is that anybody can go out and take in their first hour of use they can take a picture no one has ever seen before yeah. and that just we don't have very many moments in history like that when yeah. everybody can go out and do something uh, that has never been done and this would be you know if you go to any uh, popular destination for photographers we've seen it photographed a million times from every possible perspective I say that on the show all the time yeah yeah, yeah you know and yeah. and I, one thing that that I try to do when I go to new places and when people say oh do you want to shoot here I just think oh, it's already been done mm -hmm. like let's go for the shots that are different yeah you know? yeah that gets me because I I'm and I've said it on the show like going to the Golden Gate Bridge or Yosemite or wherever you're yeah. like okay that's great look at El Capitan it's so beautiful and it's been shot from <laughs> this exact spot about 70 million times, you know. And then you I, shoot it anyway. And I shoot it to, anyway because I'm there, you yeah. know. You shoot it anyway. But I'm always thinking, like, what can I do differently? And I think that maybe that's why I, sh I like to shoot people because they, they're always different. They look different every time you shoot them. Mm -hmm. Even if you put them in a similar location, they look different, you know. But with this, yeah, you're right. If I was at Yosemite and I, not that I could shoot in a right. national, you know, park. national park, but you could send something up and you get a unique perspective yeah. and Osmo will do the same thing you know the yeah. the thing that um, that it does is make shots look unusually professional mm -hmm. you know when you think about the things I just like, like that term I'm unusually use professional <laughs> yeah. I think about you know the like stills industry you see the background blur and mm -hmm. you think oh that looks professional professional yeah. you know yeah um, and you I must think, have a great camera yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um, then sta stable video is very similar you know yeah. people aren't used to seeing it and some of the things that I think I think this the app integration with Osmo is mm -hmm. particularly interesting because it does things like auto panorama with perfectly level horizon. I saw that. You know, yeah. like I took a panorama out here of sunrise the other day and, and the horizon's not straight. And I was b bitching about adaptive wide angle using one CPU only. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, if only I had shot it with a tripod yeah. when my kid was screaming, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> First world problems we yeah, have. Exactly. Okay. So, so since we're talking about Osmo, I want to talk about that a little bit. So the, the product itself, first describe the product. What, what is Osmo for people that may not know? It's a, it's a handheld gimbal mount. Mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's this thing. It's, it's a stick with a battery in it and yeah. Wi-Fi and a smartphone mount, a very, very sturdy multi-point smartphone mount. Smartphone mm -hmm. mount. Mm -hmm. um, it integrates with DJI Go, which is the app you use to fly these things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a, a camera mount, which is the DJI, you know, sort of standard quick release mount. Mm -hmm. um, and it supports um, the X3 camera, which is the original camera that, that actually it comes with Osmo and it also comes on the, with the Inspire mm -hmm. and the X5, which is the Zemuse X5, which is this. Yep. So you can put either one of these cameras on Osmo and it activates, powers it, connects it to the app um, and, and does the same thing that you would be able to do on a drone. And by the way, lots of people carry drones around. They run around holding a Phantom or an Inspire for Just the to get stabilization. The yeah. Yeah. yeah, Real estate people do this all the time. Wow. Um, and, you know, I, I saw it, like, basically when the Phantom first got a gimbal, I saw people carrying it around. And I just thought, oh, man, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is funny. I've done it. I carry it around. I hold it in cars, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now, I, now you just carry handheld gimbal. So, so then the, the obvious question is, we've, you know, most photographers out there have seen Steadicam, right? Right. And, and seen people use, you know, in Hollywood or whatever. And generally, if you've seen behind the scenes, they're wearing these big, giant kind of harnesses that... You know, I call them Iron Man suits, right. you know, with the camera and they're floating and all this stuff and they're getting great shots, but it looks very, 
you know, involved and right. hard and expensive to do. So what am I giving up? I mean, these, the, the Osmo is like 800 bucks or something like that, right? So what am I, am I able to get shots like that? Because they look, from the videos I saw, it looked very similar to professional Hollywood Steadicam stuff. What am I giving up by getting the Osmo versus mm -hmm. the training to do traditional Steadicam? Well, I mean, you're giving up the training, right? You don't, yeah. have, you don't need <laughs> yeah. the training and right. uh, it, you still have to move in the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that these are three axis stabilizers, so they don't stabilize up, down, left, right, forward, back. Okay. Right. So if you are bobbing up and down, your footage will move up and down. Sure. Um, so there, you know, I've seen some interesting experiments that, that do cover the vertical dimension, which is really weird because you can run with it and it just floats. In Steadicams, the, there's a lot of mass uh, on, in yeah. the system and there's a big counterweight that lowers the center of gravity below the pivot point, which is why they're so stable. It's yeah. pretty hard to throw one of those things around if you have a serious camera on it. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, you, you still need, you, it, you know, th this looks like a first person shooter walking mode. Yeah. You know, if you're playing a first person shooter, you know, the camera moves up and down yeah, and they simulate like, that kind of movement, but it's very steady. Yeah. And that's what you get with, with the sticks, with yeah. Os like Osmo or handheld gimbals. Um, Having said that, you know, the larger systems like Ronin, mm -hmm. uh, which are designed to carry heavy, heavier cameras, right. tend to be pretty stable mm -hmm. because they are, they do have a lot of mass and it's hard to move them up and down quickly. And in fact, in productions, it's very common to see a chest harness used with Ronin even yeah. because if you have a Ronin, which weighs 10 pounds and a red on it or something, you know, and you have say a, its maximum capacity is 16 pound camera. Mm -hmm. You have a 26 pound system. That's hard to hold for a long period of time. All day. Yeah. Even Ronin M, five pounds with, you know, a, I don't know, the Panasonic on it. Mm -hmm. um, that probably will, will be seven to eight pounds. Yeah. Um, that's how much my my kid weighs. Yeah. Infant, you know, and yeah. I can carry him close to my body all day, but I can't like you can't extend it out and use right. and and use get yeah, smooth footage smooth with footage. your kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always say that you can't even hold your arm out. Like, yeah. if you hold your arm out, how long can you hold it out? Oh, yeah. Not yeah. that long. Yeah, we used to do that in the military. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, so this is, this is interesting stuff. But one thing about handhelds um, yeah. and things like Ronin is that they're, because they're, they also have wireless access, you can have a camera person or a director um, controlling the camera from somewhere else. So, I mean, if you go back and look at the Ronin short that was made for the launch, yeah. um, it's it's the person carrying the camera is translating the camera, but there's a there's a director sitting somewhere else with a display controlling the camera in real time. So that's what's really interesting is suddenly you have you have a, like a camera person support wirelessly mm -hmm. while someone is moving the camera around. And the same with so these it's guys. It's very right? similar, yeah. Yeah, same with these guys. You could you could have a pilot that's in this that's controlling the aeronautics and flight path and all that, and you have someone else that, that's actually doing the photography. Right. right. And in fact, the wireless follow focus that DJI released mm -hmm. can be used, you know, was designed to be used on something like Ronin, but it actually plugs into the, the slave radio on Inspire, and you can use it to control the focus on, on this thing while it's in the air really? using a physical follow focus. Wow. So, you know, again, this is the integration stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, every, nothing is made in isolation at DJI. Yeah. Everything is made either to integrate into the system or to be integrated into the system. So you look at a product like Lightbridge 2, you mm -hmm. know, in, in these talks I give, they always ask, what's coming next? And yeah. I, I always say, I don't know why you're asking me that. <laughs> Who's going to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, no. No, nobody who works for the company. Right. But I can tell you how to predict the future, which is to look at what the company has done historically, yeah. which is work on fundamental tech, release it as in, you know, independent products, and then in, incorporate it into future integrated systems. Give us a state of the union. Where do things sit right now? Well, there, on the commercial side, um, there, there was a proposed rule, uh, which, which right now, in theory, I, we've heard that it's, it's baked, fully baked, and should be announced, I don't know when, it should go into effect maybe as early as spring. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that um, actually looks pretty good. You know, it's pretty close to how a lot of the world operates. Um, one huge unknown is something that we've been pushing very hard for, for which is called the, the, the micro rule. This would be a two kilogram cutoff for um, a, a relaxed set of restrictions. So if you're flying something under two kilograms, 4.4 pounds, mm -hmm. um, you can be much more free because it's very unlikely to, to hurt anybody um, or, you know, take a plane down, for example. Right. Um, and that's so a phantom, right? A phantom is phantom is three that. three point three pounds or something. Mm -hmm. So, this would be how things are done in Canada. There's a proposed rule in Australia like this too. Um, and uh, it's like if you're driving and you get pulled over, you show license and registration. It would be very similar to that. Yeah. 
I ideally, that's what we're all hoping for, and that would uh, not that would allow the industry to kind of push forward mm -hmm. um, without requiring these, you know, stringent rules that would apply from everything, anything from zero to fifty-five pounds. Right. So that's the NPRM or the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which is in process now. But the good news is that if you really need to operate commercially now, you can get an exemption to operate. It's just called a Section three 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 exemption. Okay. And these have been around for a while, but they were very hard to get, and wait times were sometimes like half a year, and oh, you wouldn't nice. hear back. Yeah. Now it's it's this, the process for getting one is pretty well streamlined. It's well understood. A lawyer can help you get through the process. You can find templates and download them and uh, and apply yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they come with a set of restrictions like. Uh, they they don't exempt you, for example, from needing a pilot's license, mm -hmm. and you have to do things like, you know, file, um, like a notice to to airmen when you're going to fly. And mm -hmm. so there are some things that still make it very hard to do ad hoc commercial flights. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of where we're operating now. But you would uh, need so rewind a little bit. You would need a pilot's license to, like a real pilot's uh, license. Yeah. You need a real pilot's license. That's okay. something that they are unable to exempt. Okay. For whatever reason. So if you were um, let's so use case so. I buy one of these and I decide, you know what, I'm getting pretty good, you know, piloting and, and doing mm -hmm. awesome video and photos with this. And I decide I want to go do a wedding with it and charge the bride and groom, I don't know, five grand for this particular right. add-on to the package. That's illegal unless I have a pilot's license to, and then get the, get the exemption? Yes. Now, it doesn't mean that people aren't doing it mm -hmm. and they're trying to do things like they say, well, I flew for free and I did all the editing. It's a gift. It's, it's a gift, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Probably won't hold up in court. Um, yeah. FAA hasn't gone, they haven't really gone after anybody. I mean, they actually, there's a really interesting lawsuit against um, Skypan uh, just last week where they're, they're going back in history since 2012, which is the FAA Moder Modernization and Reform Act, which outlawed commercial use of UAVs. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they're trying to now find them for all of that operation in the oh, last three geez. and a half years. Oh. Now, they're also, also an exemption holder, so it's a very interesting yeah. interesting case. So we'll see where that, where that goes. Yeah. Um, I, it's probably more of it, it's like an example. You know, like we're, we're watching, um, you know, we may go after the big guys, but they're not really an enforcement organization. And I think if you shoot a wedding, and you know, especially if it's pretty casual, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think anyone's gonna go after you. I mean, I don't think, you know, no one should say, yes, you should go do it if, you don't, if you're not ready. But right. Um, but you could get in big trouble if you were doing that, like you knew you're not supposed to be shooting, you go out there without a pilot's license or the exemption, and then something happens and someone gets hurt. If someone gets hurt, yeah. You, I mean, now I they're going to come after you with full bore. You're out there illegally. Yeah. You know, so in, insurance is definitely key. I yeah. think if you are very well insured, um, the liability is understood. And there are companies that will insure you even if you don't have an exemption. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know if any of them have been tested yet. You know, when if there's, I don't know if anything has happened that's yeah. required a claim. Yeah. So it, that's sort of unknown now. Um, on the hobby front, um, yeah. we had all been operating based on this 1981 circular from the FAA mm -hmm. advisory circular, which said like don't fly within three miles of an airport. You know, mm -hmm. all these things really meant for hobbyists. Yeah. And um, what's happened? What just happened is that all of these interim rules, including this uh, this modernization reform act, they've been uh, they've been summarized into a new advisory circular. Do you want to wait for that? No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they've been summarized into a new advisory circular, an updated one that just came out, and that has really explicit rules like five miles from an airport, under 400 feet, line of sight, you know, all the things that that people had been arguing about because the original one was. Um, uh, uh, they were guidelines, yeah. and the new one says, "No, we have the authority to regulate this space." So, um, yeah. yeah, it's moved. I mean, in fact, and it was needed because before we could have this conversation and argue about it, mm -hmm. and now I think it's hard to argue. It's pretty about. explicit. Yeah, lots of change going on. One one last thing I want to talk about is um, the follow me feature, mm -hmm. right? We've seen I've seen DJI competitors pop up with the drones that you can throw up in the air and then go water skiing and yeah. it follows you or you can climb a mountain and it follows you like in Star Trek, you know. What... <laughs> like, like in Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that happened in Star Trek. Yeah, it was in there. Um, I think it was... Kirk was climbing a mountain face and... You know, whatever. <laughs> so, um, 
Uh, is that feature built into these guys? Like, if I purchase this or a Phantom 3 tomorrow, yeah. can I go, you know, skateboarding down the street and have my drone follow me and shoot video of me? Well, it's been enabled on the Phantom 3. It's not been enabled on the Inspire 1. Okay. Um, the, the reasons for follow me not existing in the DJI lineup historically have nothing to do with implementation. You know, people say, well, if this Kickstarter company can do it, why can't DJI do it? Those people need to check their facts. Mm -hmm. I mean, Follow Me has been around for years, many, many years. Ever since these things got GPS, like a, a 3D art, like APM, that's that's their one of their earlier flight controllers. Mm -hmm. That had Follow Me as a beta like years ago. You know, I remember putting one together, and there was just a little checkbox in the giant list of 500 checkboxes. Yeah. It said Follow Me beta, and you could check it, and it would follow you. Really? So. It would, it would just lock onto your phone or whatever? Lock onto your, your phone that's attached to you know, ra a radio. Yeah. Um, and now the controller. So the Follow Me has, is not new. And most of the Kickstarters that have spun up use APM, and they just enable Follow Me. Now, some of them have said, OK, we're going to have you know, uh, computer vision to help to avoid obstacles. Um, I'm skeptical about that from a Kickstarter company. I think it's going to happen, and maybe the, these companies will be able to do it. And it's not to say that it's impossible. Yeah. It's to say that it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to produce the product, manufacture the product, sell the product, support the product. These are things that are very hard to do. Build a company in yeah. the meantime. Um, so you can pay for that risk, but I'm very skeptical. Yeah. You know? Show so, me the money. Yeah, and, and DJI did enable Follow Me on Phantoms and not Inspire because this is $3,000 or 4500 with the X5. Yeah. It's too risky to do follow me on something like this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Maybe if you're in the desert or you're Simply on the... safe. Uh, yeah. Something with... N some place with no obstacles. You're on the ocean. You're an expert. You know how to get it back to the boat. Maybe you could do it. Mm -hmm. If you're rock climbing, if you're skiing down with a mountain with a lot of trees, um, I, I just don't... It's not there yet. And, yeah. um, it's going to be here soon because I think... You know, all of these sense and avoid systems that, that we've seen in prototype form are going to come on the market. In 2016, there will for sure be at least one drone with computer vision based sense and avoid. Yeah. Um, and that's when things will get interesting because then you can be pretty sure you're not going to, it's not going to automatically crash into something. Yeah. I think what will happen in 2016 is that drones will stop when, they, when they're about to hit something. Yeah. And, and they'll probably just stay there or they'll yeah. probably go home. They'll do something, but they're probably not going to intelligently avoid it and do some cool move to go around the tree. Yeah. Like what self-driving you know, cars can do that, right? So They can, but people <laughs> make, well, people make mistakes around self-driving cars. That's true. Um, so for sure that it's a problem that will be solved, but in the short term, I would be, oh, it's still blinking, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be really skeptical about uh, follow me. And, and personally, I don't, I don't use it, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. P I people mean, who don't know about it, who have never heard of, Aerial imaging. They see, you know, a slick marketing video with mm -hmm. "Follow Me," and they think that's what I need. Like, yeah. The the only reason you can do "Follow Me" uh, right now, I think, is if you don't sell any products. Mm -hmm. like if you don't sell a product, you can say you do "Follow Me." Right. If you do sell product and you have to support the product, you can't do "Follow Me," because people will. Wh whose fault is it? You know, you turn "Follow Me" on and it follows you into a tree. Well, you told it to follow you, and you got you put yourself in a position where a tree was in the way. It's kind of your fault. Right. But people are going to fight that. They're going to say, well, DJI or whatever company implemented Follow Me and it, f it crashed into something. Give me my money back. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when I was working at the company, I couldn't say anything. But now I can just say, well, it's kind of, it's your fault. Yeah. Cry foul. 100%. Yeah. Love it. Love it. See, you're going to be the voice of reason for the industry. That's, that's your... Oh, don't get me started. That's your new flag. <laughs> the voice of reason for the, for the UAV drone right. industry. I love it. Okay, uh, last question. Let's wrap it up here. Um, you know, people always ask this. Okay, where, you know, what what's next for the company? I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and say, okay, knowing what we know now, you know, even putting on take all your insider knowledge out of it, you know, but knowing what we know now about the space and the competition out there, what what's the vector? Where where are we seeing things going in the next couple of years? You know, it took us less than two years to go from zero to here. Right. Right. Two years from now, now that DJI and other companies know all this stuff and the pressure of competition is pushing down and there's GoPro in there mm -hmm. throwing their hat in the rings, et cetera, et cetera. What are we going to see in a couple of years? I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think we've gotten to the point now where a, a competent 
pilot, mm -hmm. you know, who's experienced and has a lot of practice, yeah. can do really amazing things with, with one of these, mm -hmm. right? We can, like when I fly, I don't have to think, right? I, you sort of will a camera to move in space. Mm -hmm. That's 3D space. Pretty cool, yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of crashes required to get there, you know, yeah. to that point. Um, yeah, that's gonna be me. <laughs> yeah, um, so, you know, luckily, like phantoms are actually really hard to, in fact, if you're gonna practice with the phantom, just as an aside, mm -hmm. get a gimbal guard. You know, people sell like carbon fiber plate, you just zip tie it to the, the landing gear, mm -hmm. and it prevents things from getting in and hitting the gimbal oh. when you crash. Okay, um, yeah. done. So I think going forward, like what we're starting to see is um, platforms for creating drones with, with a lot of computation power on board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Qualcomm's in this space, they have basically like a, a drone on a chip kit, Jeez. you know? Yeah. And, and so they, they have infrastructure. If you want to build a drone, you could use Qualcomm, just like if you wanted to build a phone, you could use, or a camera, you could use Snapdragon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, these platforms are starting to spin up with a lot of comp computational power. Mm -hmm. That's going to push DJI for sure will have computation on board because everyone else is, is getting in. Mm -hmm. And that, that means is if you're a developer, and by, by developer I mean either you're building a company that builds drones or you're a, a, a developer who wants to build on a platform and you're going to release an app or something. Mm -hmm. um, and you can take advantage of all that on board power. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the things that they're going to integrate into these systems are things like depth maps you know like if you are on a tripod obviously it's very hard to get a depth map without light field yeah. or yeah. moving the camera or stereo more than one camera photogrammetry these things are moving in space so if you take multiple pictures as you're going and analyze them you can actually build a 3d map of your environment in real time so i think in a year or two pretty much like navigation will have a lot more information to work with mm -hmm. you know these are dumb right now you fly it forward it flies into stuff that's because it doesn't know there's a tree there yeah. but if you fly forward for one second and you have computer vision s r algorithms running on board yeah. you know there's something there you know there's something and it's getting bigger in the frame you know nice. that means it's an object that so that you can smarter. see yeah. so they're going to get a lot smarter and i think i think the real question is going to be what happens with regulation yeah. Right now, the rules say basically one pilot to one drone, manual piloting, doesn't really talk about autonomy. And mm. I mean, it does talk about autonomy. Mostly it says you can't do it. And in, in the proposed micro rule, it says no autonomy whatsoever. And, and that's Interesting. And really that's weird. Just for those I, who don't know, autonomy would be when I say, okay, I'm going to program a preset flight path for this guy to go do and hit a button and let it go do it. Well, that would be... I think that would be more like automatic okay. flight. Autonomy would be like, it decides where to go. Oh. So, you know, you can say, meet me on the other side of that tree, and it, Figures out the it would path. figure it out. Now, I, I had, had, have had arguments with mostly military people about what, what autonomy means. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's, it's intelligently deciding how to navigate or accomplish some action. So these would be like systems that um, know where the sun is in the sky and follow you and capture amazing footage, but they put them between you and the sun, for example, for the best lighting. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these kinds of cinematic A lot of photographers algorithms. don't know that. <laughs> well, I like backlit stuff, yeah. too. So. Especially yeah. with these cameras, like, you can shoot anything with this. It's you fine. can, you can. Yeah, the um, drone can say, you know, I made a creative decision. <laughs> Owner, I decided I wanted the backlight in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you put your head right in the center? I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. um, That's so cool, man. So more, I, you know, someone asked me today, uh, mostly because I went public with leaving DJI. Mm -hmm. They said, wow, has DJI peaked? You know, why are you leaving? Like, no, DJI is at the very beginning. Yeah. You know, the, this tech is barbaric compared to what we're going to see in the future of drone technology. I mean, these are the very first machines that are being made in this entirely new industry and it's very easy to to block ourselves off to to being able to see what's coming but yeah. i mean if you look at what's in a smartphone those are really complicated now yeah none of that i mean we have sensors in here but these are very basic compared to your typical smartphone yeah so yeah. we're at be the cool. beginning that's yeah. exciting eric chang thank you so much, sir Carter. congratulations on your move and thank what's you, going to Let's stay in touch. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we could do some stuff. There's something together. there. Yeah, yeah, there's something there. Eric Chang, 
formerly of DJI. <laughs> this is Inspire Inspire One, right? Inspire One. This is actually Inspire One Pro mm. prototype. This it's is the one I'm taking one. home with me, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the, and the Zenmuse X5 Micro Four Thirds camera. This is what I need. I need that too. All right. So by the time you see this, I'll probably have purchased this, that, <laughs> and the Osmo. I probably crashed it and crashed it once or twice. Yeah. All right, guys. I'm Frederick Van Johnson. We'll see you in the next video.